Okay, so let's kick it off. Welcome, uh, my name is Jonas Balosin. I'm from Wien, I've just moved to Wien. Uh, actually, I work for Raiffeisen as a software uh, architect. And today we are going to discuss about performance. And I'm quite uh, interested how would you receive this presentation because I did it to other conferences and the final feedback was, oh, we, we seem, it seems like we are in the faculty. But now I think it's a good place to, to redo all the things because I think you have all of this fresh in mind. Uh, just a quick uh, quiz, who uh, has experience in C++? Hands up. Okay, very good. Java, guys. Wow. Compilers, hardware, assembly. Who work with those? Good, very good. So you actually you should know everything I'm going to teach you today because it's it's a presentation, it's a top-down presentation. So we will we will go through a lot of techniques, tactics, and all everything will be studied from a performance standpoint. Other things about me, apart from uh, the, the Raiffeisen job, I also have conduct train, uh, technical trainings, especially on the performance field. I'm very keen on performance on all the levels. And also, if you want to stay in touch with me, this is my Twitter account, and I started um, a blog. So you can easily find my articles. And don't forget, before to leave, there are some goodies here in front for you. Just pick one before, before you leave the room. But everything has been said, so let's start with the presentation itself. How I structure the presentation? I structure in different la layers. The first layer is about design principles. The second is about tactics, patterns, algorithms, data structures. Then we will continue with OS guidelines and hardware guidelines. So as you can see, the abstraction is lower at the bottom and it's high uh, in the first layer for the design principle, but the complexity is twisted because the things are becoming more complex since you touch the, the lowest layer and it's more complicated. Uh, everything uh, being said, I've created also a latency hierarchical model. You can use this model in your project, for example, depending on how performance is impacting your requirements in order to map. And at the end of the talk, after I will go through all of these tactics, techniques, I will assign each of them to this uh, hierarchical model so you can take this model and use it in your project. The first layer of this model is about the projects where the performance is not an ASR or an architecture significant requirement, which means, for example, you have a latency around seconds. So you shouldn't care too much about performance because it's almost all the cases, it's there. There, um, the second layer is the layer with affordable latency, which means, for example, you have a request and you receive a response around hundreds of milliseconds, still not quite stringent requirement. The third one is the low latency, and here the, the challenging things are, are starting because you have to deal with a lot of techniques, tactics, some of them, I'll cover them in the presentation, and the ultra low latency, which is, is the, the, the top one, the challenging one, where you can apply everything and you should be aware also of the hardware and how to tune the full stack, not only at the programmer level. So as I said, we, uh, during this presentation, we will study different techniques and at the end we will map them and you can use this model in your application based on your performance requirements and you can play with some of them. First, before to start, let's define what is performance. And for the definition of the performance, I took a very, very simple definition. It's in software architecture in practice, and it says performance is about time and the ability to meet time requirements. So that's, that's it, actually. It's about timing and to meet those time requirements. It doesn't matter the requirement should be hundreds of milliseconds, milliseconds, seconds. If you meet those requirements, it means your application fulfills those. And also on the market, in the industry, a lot of people make confusions. They 
call non-functional requirement like performance, scalability, availability, you will always heard about a non-functional requirement. However, if you are a technical guy, I advise you to stop using non-functional requirements but quality attributes because they describe the internal quality of your system. And also I wrote an article for the Inter InfoQ. It says, does ID industry needs better naming? So when I explain all the rationale why I would kindly advise you to use quality attributes but not non-functional requirement anymore. And let's start now with the design principle. What are these design principles? First of all, it's cohesion. It's a very, very simple um, concept. What means cohesion? Actually, it refers to the degree of uh, which the, the modules or elements that work together, they should be bundled together. And here you can see the green ones are bundled together, the yellow ones are bundled together, the red ones are bundled together. Why cohesion? It's important because bundling them together, the ones that have high degree of interaction, you also use, uh, also you are also friendly from a CPU perspective because they have a better locality. If you don't do that, they are very sparse away and uh, on the main memory and you pay the cost of CPU stalls. Being compact, it's also good from the C perspective. So uh, as a takeaway, measure the cohesion in your project. There are a lot of tools on the market to do that. And if the cohesion is not good, try to refactor and bundle the things that work together together. Keep the, the things as small as possible. Be CPU cache friendly. The other advice is in terms of abstractions. As Dijkstra said, the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to be very specific in the new semantic layer. For example, I have here a shape, which is an abstract class, and it has three implementations, like tri rectangle, triangle, and right triangle. And each of these override, for example, the get area. The thing is how it works during the runtime, uh, the, the just-in-time compiler from the Java or GCC or Clang or every for each of these compilers, the get area, it's, it's actually a virtual call. And Java does that via polymorphies, but these virtual calls impacts a lot the runtime. For example, to, to switch from one instance to another and to the third one, you pay the cost of several nanoseconds. And it really matters if you really are on the ultra low latency projects. So my advice is minimize the number of abstractions because also if you are using hotspot, there are some issues and from the uh, starting with the third implementation, the just-in-time compiler in the hotspot cannot inline or do any optimization. So until the third uh, implementation, there are optimizations which just-in-time compiler are, it's triggering, but starting with the third one, there is no optimization and you pay the, the cost of the runtime virtual call. So be careful with this kind of abusive, I would say, abstractions in, in your pro projects. The next one is psychometric complexity. You see very, very basic things. What means the psychometric complexity? Actually, it refers to the number of uh, independent paths that your program execution flow can have during the runtime. For example, if you have if else, if else, if else, if else, it creates a lot of branches, right? And the thing is that when those branches are executed during the runtime, if those branches are not predictable, you pay the cost of a CPU stall. And paying the cost of a CPU stall, you, need, you add a bit of latency. So my advice for you is measure the psychometric complexity. Again, there are a lot of tools and try to mimic the number uh, if else, if else is in the code because they are not good. They are not very, very friendly from the performance perspective because the, 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 the CPU predictor cannot guess if you are very, very irregular in following on those branches, what would be the next branch. So don't code with a lot of if else, especially embedded if else. Uh, or switch or cases on uh, all these kind of things are not good from a performance perspective Try to minimize all of them and as a recommendation help the processor help the hardware to make good 
predictions by minimizing the, the number of branches, or even if you can't do that, be very predictable in, in most of the cases. It really helps the CPU and it really helps the performance overall. We learn also from, from high school, uh, from faculties, that big O complexity matters. And uh, as you can see, the big O complexity, higher the big O complexity is, we impact the serviceability, which means our algorithm, it's more complex. So implicitly, I would say, we wait more time until I receive the response. However, the question which raises, Let's study how big O complexity influences or works on modern hardware. And if, when I say modern hardware, I'm also referring to the CPU caching. How it fits into the modern hardware? Is it all about big O complexity nowadays? And for that, let's have an example. Uh, it's a very basic one. Uh, the, the, the thing is, I, I took a two-dimensional array, like a matrix, and I want to traverse the matrix, first row traversal, which means I keep the same row, but I change the columns. And the second one, I keep the column, but I change the row. From code perspective, this is the two, two Java snapshots, very simple to understand. Uh, the only difference is in this inner loop, here I say matrix A, J, and here I say matrix J, I. But apart this, it's the same. What is the complexity for it? Yeah. It's all and uh, a power to very simple. So as you can see, I, I, you can judge, OK, if I test these two programs during the runtime, I can say they should be, behave the same, right? Because they have the same big O complexity. However, it's not the case. Because if you just write these two simple programs and you profile them for different matrix sizes, like 64, 5, 12, 10, 24, and so on, in and if you get the number of operations uh, per microsecond, you can see that in almost of the cases, and not in almost, in all the cases, the road traversal was be best, better, because it has more operations per millisecond. So it means it, it was more, more efficient. In as opposite to the column traversal, as you can see, for example, uh, 0, 012, 0, 003, or even more, this one, uh, the, the bigger matrix, it's around one order of magnitude. However, initially, both of them have the same complexity. And the question is, why? Why is it happening to have such big discrepancy? And let's get back to hardware to understand what's happening because, of course, it's, it's the caching and how it works plays a very uh, fundamental role. And in order to understand and to profile, I also rerun the program on Linux with perf command. Have you used perf command on Linux? OK, very good. So if you, you can use perf command and profile the CPU uh, counters. and for the CPU counters, what I was interested in were the cycles per instructions and the number of misses for L1 for low, uh, last layer, uh, for example, L3 in my case, and translation leukocyte buffer. And all of these were worse in the column traversal fashion. That's why uh, it has an impact also on the throughput. Now you have more context, but you still maybe don't have a clear picture why it is happening, because you have all the figures around the, this, this CPU counters. But let's see why it is happening. And to see why it is happening, it's a very, very basic explanation. It's the way how CPU works in regards with the CPU cache lines. For example, when you, create, when you access the first uh, two-dimensional array in the row traversal fashion, what it means, you access the first element. Of course, there will be a miss. However, because you access the first one, all the others are automatically laid out in the, CP, in the same CPU cache line because they are compacted. And the thing is how the CPU is working from, from a cache perspective, it sees the, the, the virtual memory in chunks of 64 bytes. So whatever you request something, the, the, the first line 
line of cache it's filled until the 64 bytes. So even if you request one element, because the next elements are collocated, they are automatically filled in the same CPU cache line. And when you access the second, the third, the fourth, until the, it fits the 64 bytes, you have everything in there, so the number of misses is lower. As opposite to the column traversal, you just uh, request one element. The full CPU cache line is filled, but you, re you read only one element out of that CPU cache line, and all the other elements the, we, we took together with the CPU cache line, it's evicted. So it's a very, very inefficient way of traversing this data structure. That's why you had that CPU stalls and, and in, in the column traversal. Which leads me to the conclusion that service time, it's and a big O notation, this complexity, it's not a, a lot, it's not all. So you need to be careful about how the CPU works and the caching effect because it helps you a lot. Big O complexity, it's useful when you have huge data sets where CPU caches couldn't help. However, in all the other cases, Caching and the CPU caching helps you a lot in, in performance. As a recommendation, reduce the code footprint as small as, uh, as possible, small and clean methods, and minimize the number of indirections. Keep the, the objects collocated. Uh, in Java, we pay this cost of, of not value, of not having value types or structs like in C++. However, try to model and to minimize the number of indirections and keep the objects collocated and very compact in, in the memory. The next uh, layer is about tactics, patterns, algorithms, and data structures. Caching, uh, it's a very interesting concept uh, because, for example, caching reduces uh, the, the serviceability or the, the response time where you have, for example, subsequent requests which are identical because you have already data pre-computed in the cache. That's the idea. It's very easy nowadays to, to have a caching solution to plug it in your application and to work, but it's very difficult to properly tune it. Because to properly tune it, you need to understand more things. You need to understand what would be the data patterns inside the cache, which means read write through policies. So, uh, for example, when you have a request, it hits the cache. If the cache is synchronously um, in sync with the persistent or it is asynchronously. For example, you write something in the cache and that is synchronously written to the persistence, which is the case for, for write through or write behind. It is decoupled and asynchronously writes to the database. Depends on the context. Also, the eviction algorithms, it, it's important to properly tune it because uh, most of them might come, for example, with lists recently used or least frequently used policies so based on the nature of the application first uh, try to identify the number of misses and then to properly tune your cache. Fetching strategy depends on the data volatility that you have in your project. For example, if you have a lot of static data which doesn't change, it might be suitable for a prefetching strategy, which means you prefetch the data and afterwards, when it is requested, it is already in the cache because it has less volatility, doesn't change a lot. Or on demand, if it is, for example, requested, there is a cache miss, it goes and it is retrieved from the persistence and could be also predictive, which is more challenging to implement based on the way you access the data. You can also think of a pattern to pre-fill the, the data in the cache in advance for you, because in this case, you minimize the number of misses. And the last, but also very important, especially when you deal with distributed applications, it's the to topology of it. Because you can have it locally on just one instance, you can have it partitioned slash distributed, or you can have it partitioned and replicated. 
which means partitioned and replicated. For example, it, it's, it's partitioned on different instances, and I have at least one or two replicas for each, which means I, I'm ultra highly available because I have only two nodes. If I go down, there are other two nodes with the same data, uh, copy of data. If you deal with, for example, um, distributed applications where when you have scalability and ultra highly availability, probably you need to go in this direction. The question is how many replicas do you afford? And by default, most of the applications that I saw, uh, there are N plus two, which means two additional replicas. But again, it depends from the application to application. Batching, it's another concept. Uh, what is batching? Actually, it bundles, um, bundles multiple requests in one single unit, like this one, and it sends it to the, to the receiver. Uh, it's easy, right? So you can do batching just like that. Put a lot of requests, bundle, wrap, and send that once. However, it's not so easy as it might look like because if you want to tune, and if I ask you what would be the optimal batch size, what would be the answer? Of course, you need to take into account two other things, the bandwidth and the round trip time. What is the bandwidth? It's actually how much information, how big I can create this single piece of unit in order to be closer to the max uh, bandwidth, the maximum amount of information I could send, but also the round trip time is important because the round trip time, if it goes up, it's not optimal for me. It's important to have the, a lower round trip time. So maximum bandwidth and minimum round trip time. And be, uh, Having this into consideration with these ones, I can properly tune uh, the batch size. Because otherwise, just to create batching and send it over the wire, it's, it's OK. You have batching, but it's not optimal. There is also very important, I would quite advise you to read this uh, BBR congestion control. It's a paper, and it explains these principles, how this guy uh, tuned the batch size, uh, taking into account the bandwidth and the round trip time to have the optimal transfer over the wire. So it's, it's quite interesting. Asynchronous. Um, have you played with asynchronous frameworks? Have you programmed coded asynchronously? Oh, cool. That's cool. Um, the advice, at least from Martin Thompson, uh, is design asynchronously by default because asynchronously it helps you in terms of scalability. You can easily scale. And uh, uh, you might notice that all the modern applications, the tendency is to go into asynchronously. Synchronously, um, we, have still, uh, we still have synchronous calls because HTTP by, by nature is synchronously. But however, try to play with this asynchronous paradigm. It's, it's more interesting. And I would say, if you can also add on top of it stateless, or at least to segregate in your application what is stateful, what is stateless, it's, it's way better. Because, for example, if you have an asynchronous call to this thread, for example, in meanwhile, you, you are notified with the response. You can process any other tasks instead of just waiting for the synchronous call until this one it's, it's finished. So think of it. In Java, for example, there, there is not quite a, a, a huge... Um, uh, it's not a lot in this way. However, there are a lot of libraries that you can use. Uh, JDK comes with this completable future, future, publisher, subscriber, and subscription. These are from JDK 9. These were already there. Also, they are in 8. So not a lot. As you can see, it's a bit minimal support. But however, you can use any other frameworks around the Java ecosystem, and it, it's, it works perfectly good. Another important fact is data memory access patterns. In essence, uh, three of them are very important. Stridid, the first one, what is stridid? Stridid means, for example, when you have um, a data structure and you access it in the predictable way using a constant stride. For example, I have an array and I access that array one by one. That, my, that one would be my stride. And is the first scenario, so you can see uh, this is the memory, let's suppose, um, and you access one by one elements. 
spatial is the second case where it says the elements collocated to the ones that I already requested, they are likely to be requested. Which means, for example, if I request this element, there might be, because this one is collocated, there are likely chances to be also this one uh, requested later on. And think about how CPU caches work. If you request something and the, the next two element, it's, it's very collocated and both of them can feed in the same CPU cache line. Even if you request this one, you have already in the same CPU cache line the next one. So there are better chances to request the next one. Now this is about spatiality. And temporality, it means, for example, things that are already, were already in the cache, they are likely to be reaccessed or accessed again. And for example, uh, this is the case where you completely uh, randomly walk through the heap and access different elements uh, on the idea that the elements that you randomly accessed previously will be accessed again. So these are the main categories. And to see how big impact from performance each of these have, I've created a very, very simple application. You can do it also on your own. I created the long array. Uh, the, the length was two gig over size of long. And within four gig of heap memory, I used the, all of these three uh, patterns to access the elements. And as you can see, the strided one, which means based on the predictable pattern, was the best. Do you know how much is the latency of retrieving something from L1 CPU cache? How many nanoseconds? Hundreds, thousands? Three. Three, very good, very good. So it's almost one, two, three. I would say depends, but almost it's one, two, three. For example, in my case, it was around one nanosecond, which means in this case, proof that's all the elements, almost all, were on the L1 CPU cache, so I didn't pay add any, any stall. The special one it was around 5 nanoseconds, which were about between L1 and L2 CPU cache line, and temporal one, it, it hit most of the times the L3 cache, or L2, L3. So you can see it's a very, very big impact, and depends on how you structure the data and how you access the data, you get a lot of performance if you are conscious and if you model your data in such way. Log-free algorithms. Have you heard about log-free algorithms? Good. <laughs> I don't have a lot to tell you today. Uh, Log-free algorithms, it means that, for example, uh, if you stick on this paradigm, the, it guarantees there is a system global progress wide. Which means, for example, there is no a case where one thread can block indefinitely the other thread. And this log-free algorithm has two important properties. They guarantee that things happen in a correct order and uh, certain things happen atomically. However, if you want to do log-free algorithms, also in Java it's, it's, uh, it's way complicated now with the new APIs. It's challenging and in, in case of hardware, in, ca in the absence of hardware support, it's very, very uh, difficult, I would say. So be careful um, if you try to, to stick with this. It's, it's, it's very challenging, I would say, and you need to also have the hardware support because you need atomicity and you need certain memory barriers and all the things that I, I might not talk today about them. But in essence, it's, it's, it's a, a good way to, to, um, to code as opposite with the, the classical paradigm when you, for example, are using synchronized or logs all in all over the places. And this compare and swap, it's basically the, the easiest way to do log-free uh, programming uh, because what it says, um, I'm able to update a value in the main memory if I have the latest value locally. Suppose that main memory has 99 and there are two threads, uh, one and two, and this one has the 99, which is the, la the, the new one, and this one has 98. And of course, if I have to update this uh, in the main memory using a CAS operation, the second thread fails because it doesn't have the last value. And of course, it needs to reread the, the uh, value from the main memory and updates it. And this is uh, implemented and uh, provided by hardware. That's why I was saying 
previously that you need to have hardware support to properly work with this. In Java, there are some APIs you can, uh, for the atomics uh, wrappers, the, you have compare and swap uh, or compare and sweat set, and there are also data structures that are using CAS. For example, reentrant logs are very interesting to, to use them, or concurrent link queue. They are lock free uh, data structures that you can play and you replace the traditional ones because you can benefit of, of better performance if you properly uh, use them. OP. Uh, I started uh, my, my programming uh, lessons uh, learning about OP, which basically I don't say it's, it's, um, it's bad, but however, uh, let's see what is the impact from the performance if you bundle your objects and you are focused on the OOP. For example, you have this account, which is actually a wrapper um, of all of these fields. It's active, account, username, and so on. And the question is, I want to iterate through all of these accounts. And for the accounts which are not active, I want to trigger an event. For example, I say, hey, customer, please change your password or whatever. And how it looks like in practice, you create a list of all of these and you iterate for each object. You grab out of this list each of object and you say dot is active and you trigger this event, right? It's a very, very simple. However, it's very inefficient. I will tell you why. Um, in uh, putting aside what it's written here, uh, maybe um, it says actually in, in Java there is a just-in-time compiler and just-in-time compiler has a sort of optimizations. One of these optimizations it's inlining. So if the compiler is not able to do here inlining, which means to remove this virtual call to the field itself, it's very inefficient. Why? Because you have all of these uh, elements in a list and all the times when you say is active you suffer a cache miss especially because it's a list. What happens? Uh, so you, you traverse that this, this previous list and you, in order to access this is active field, you load all the field in the CPU cache line. So you load all the field, this is the object header in Java, it's around 12, uh, 12 or uh, 8 or 16, depends. Also in C++, there is a bit of penalty. However, you fill all of this CPU cache line from 0 to 64 with information regarding this account wrapper, and out of it, you access only one uh, byte, for example. And it's very inefficient because you fill a lot of CPU cache lines, read only one byte out of them, and they are evicted if they are not reused soon. How would you model this? The answer is to uh, try data-oriented design. Data-oriented design means, for example, uh, it's, it's focused on how the data is accessed, and it bundles which, uh, the data which is uh, uh, frequently accessed together. In this case, uh, I created an ACC data which creates all of these booleans in one array and I traverse the array. It's a similar case of traversing just one single dimensional array because in this case, it's um, like we discussed for the metrics. First, you will have a cache miss, but then if you access the first element, after you access the first element, all the others are on the same CPU cache line. So you minimize the number of misses. And data-oriented design, it's, it's very used in, in gaming industry where the guys are very keen on, on squeezing the ultimate performance. They measure the CPU cache misses, then they measure how efficient, uh, how efficient is uh, the data eviction and so on, and they are doing a lot of such tricks. So if you have similar problem, maybe try with this data-oriented design and try to remodel the things. OS guidelines is the third uh, level, uh, thread affinity, which means actually thread affinity. It's important for one thread to be bound to one core or multiple cores, ideally on the same socket. Why? Because if the thread is descheduled, there is no guarantee it might be scheduled on the same core or on the same uh, range of cores. 
and it impacts the caches. Because this thread, before to be, uh, to, to be descheduled, it, for example, pre-filled some caches, some CPU caches, and after it is rescheduled, especially on another core, the other socket, all of these uh, caches are pre-filled, are, are lost, actually. So uh, to have this, uh, you need actually to, to use in Java this library or in Linux or C or C++. It's, it's quite easy because they are native languages. So task set or sched set affinity. Non-uniform memory access. Uh, the non-uniform memory access says actually um, the time I spent to re uh, retrieve uh, one object from the memory depends on how the, if the memory is local to that socket or not. In essence, which means actually uh, if I'm scheduled on this core and I want to retrieve the object which is remote, I have to wait until the, the, the request is propagated to, to this um, hypertransport and QPI bus retrieves and uh, it's, it's sent back here. Ideally, I don't want to have this and I want to use the local memory to that local socket. This is how I minimize this latency. Um, how you do that actually uh, in Linux, you can use the NUMA control or also if you are using the JVN, uh, unfortunately in, in, the, in the hotspot, there is ja only one collector which is NUMA aware and it is the parallel GC which is not the default one starting the JDK9, so you have to enable it. Uh, also for the G1 which is the last uh, and enable starting nine, there is a JEP. It's, it's actually a proposal to make it new malware. However, it's not there. So be careful because in Java it's, it's very tricky and it doesn't properly work. Uh, large pages, um, what happens, for example, when you retrieve something from the Main, uh, from, from, uh, from the main memory, you, there is a translation between uh, the vir virtual address and the physical address. And that translation, um, it's based on a short, uh, short cache, which is called TLB, translation leukocyte buffer. So every time you, you want to retrieve something from the main memory, um, there is a translation. And the, for, for example, you have this virtual address, and in order to access the, the physical memory, uh, the TLB is first checked if it is, uh, the translation is there or not. If the translation wasn't here, you have a TLB miss and you have to walk the page. And walking the page is very costly because in essence it spent tens or hundreds of cycles. So ideally, in order to minimize this, I would prefer to have less TLB misses. To have less TLB misses, what are the options? First, it's either increase this cache, either make the, the physical memory large with large pages because having large pages I fall the the same translation will fall into the same entry in the TLB the first option making the TLB bigger it's not quite handy because you need to have a TLB short because it needs to be very efficient and the handy way is to make the page larger in the main memory so this is the only acceptable uh, option. However, uh, for example, in Java, you need to use large pages and you need to also have the OS support. On Solaris, it's active by default. It's enabled by default. On Linux and Windows, no, there is no such. And uh, maybe uh, because it's, uh, you might ask yourself, okay, but how I can do, um, how I can test this from a developer perspective? It's quite simple. Um, if you have some performance penalties and if you profile your application with this, for these CPU uh, counters, like TLB misses and TLB page walks, you can do that with perf and you spend a significant amount of time in those enable large pages because it's a sign that your application suffer of this. However, even if you don't profile, but you know the nature of the application, so if you, for example, have a, an application which use intensive memory, a huge amount of memory, but with continuous, contiguous memory accesses, it also helps because having it contiguously, you fall onto the same large page 
from, from the memory. Also, it's not, uh, it's not like the golden hammer. If you have applications which have a small working set or if you have still a huge amount of heat but it's very sparsely, large pages doesn't help you. So be careful. You can profile it, as I, I was saying here, or you can also think in advance based on, on the nature of your application. Uh, and maybe the last one, um, RAMFS or TempFS is quite important when you have uh, a lot of uh, I.O. operations. Uh, for example, you have abusive loggings in your application, right? Why you should all the times use the, the, the physical? You can map them using RAMFS and TempFS and read, uh, read and write into the, the uh, memory. However, be careful because it's volatile, so you need, if you read and write to the memory, you need to, an asynchronous job to, to read and write it from there and make it persistent. So you, it's very efficient, but you pay because it's, it's everything, it's volatile. And also, just to give you an idea how performance is that, um, I used RAMFS, for example, and my test was I sequentially read write 8 gig in chunk of 4K, 5K, 512 on, S, on my SHD, uh, S, SHD um, HDD and RAMFS. And RAMFS was, in essence, 8 to 10 times faster. So it's incredibly faster if you use RAMFS or TempFS. But again, it's not suitable for all kind of, of cases. Uh, if you have especially logging, it works very good. And I won't go further into the last um, uh, layer. Uh, actually, it's about um, uh, uh, it's about uh, fault sharing. Um, I, I will tweet the slides after the presentation, and you can have all the information in here. So if you want something, you can also please approach me. You can also please tweet me and I'll answer to your question. Thanks a lot for this. It was a pleasure to be in a university. Actually, it was my, my first time since I attend uh, uh, conferences. I've never uh, conducted the session in a conference. I had a deja vu when I came here because I, I graduated computer science compilers. Uh, and it was a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you and wish you a very pleasant day. We have a small gift for you. So Thank you. Thank you so much.